it's going. So the first um, part here is about uh, descriptive statistics. Um, and then we will continue with the part using uh, graphs and tables to visualize data. So let's see. So this is the thing that we are going to mainly work on in this course, uh, what we call a data set. Um, it will consist of recorded values for some variables that we might be interested in. And of course, usually a data will be stored in a data file on a computer ultimately. And we have some software that we can use to, to work on it. Um, what you see here, this is the file that I also showed you uh, in the first lecture, I think. We did a little play on SPSs with this file. It's a set of demographic data from uh, a set of countries. And this is basically what we call more or less raw data. Um, and you really gain little understanding of what you're analyzing by just staring at this data here. So what we call descriptive statistics are several ways of summarizing and visualizing uh, content of such a data file to make it sort of interesting and informative for a human uh, viewer. So there are different kinds of descriptive uh, statistics. One thing is what we call um, summary measures uh, or key numbers. And that would be like, instead of looking at a list of numbers, just to compute the mean of it and the standard deviation and the minimum and the maximum, suddenly you have some more interesting information about that variable in the data set. And I, of course, very important in presenting and overviewing data is what we call uh, graphical displays. And of course, you have seen dozens of that before. Um, just open a newspaper today, you will probably see some sort of descriptive display of some data. Um, we are going to learn later on how to compute all of this stuff and to produce graphics with SPSS. But for now, we are just going to discuss what we are actually doing uh, or what kinds of summary measures and graphics that are relevant in, in different cases. It's a little bit annoying for my neck to go like this, so maybe I should... Uh, look like this, or look into this. Um, so the first thing we are going to do is to distinguish between um, different types of variables. So, uh, yeah, right, so... Let's see how this works. So this is a data set and you see those columns, this is what we call variables in a data set. And we have recorded different values of the variables. Um, so we are now talking about what kind of types of variables uh, do we have. And so the, the reason for this is, of course, the way we want to summarize data is depending on what type of variables we are dealing with. Um, so the main distinctions could be 
on one hand numerical. Um, so this is when there is a natural way of numbering what you are studying. If you measure uh, an amount of money or a weight of something physical or you count something, uh, then you end with a variable that is numerical. So this is fairly obvious, I guess. Something that is meaningful to assign a number to. And let me see. We will go into these distinctions a little bit more in detail later, but there are two types of this of numerical variables, one called discrete and another called continuous variable. Um, so those are kind of subclasses of the numerical. Then the, the other big class of, or big type of variable is uh, what we call categorical variable. Is that the difference between and, uh, I will come back to that on the next slide or something. Yeah. Um, so we have numerical and categorical. So this is when there are typically no, no uh, numerical values, if you think of color of cars and so on. So I'm coming also back to that in, in greater detail. But numerical and categorical is the the main classes, and then there are subclasses of these two. So now we are talking about numerical variables, something we can assign a number to. And then I said there were two classes, there were discrete uh, variables. And this is uh, when you have a sort of a limited or prescribed set of values that this variable can attain, okay? So if you count something that has um, not too many values, then you are looking at a discrete variable. For instance, the number of children of a woman, for, for instance. So take, uh, in a sample, you have a set of uh, women and the number of children is a discrete numerical variable because it can take values 0, 1, 2, and then up to some reasonable limit, let's say. Okay, there are a few women who have more than 15, but it's very uh, uncommon. I think maybe, yeah, maybe not very many. Hmm. Um, okay, let's introduce a little bit of notation here. You know what this means in mathematics or in statistics or in computing? If I say this is just because when we deal with statistics or computing, you say a hundred times during a lecture the number of this, the number of that. So we have a shorthand when I want to write it. I don't want to write the number off so many times. So. We use this little shorthand. This means the same as the number of children, for instance. So the number of this, the number of that. Um, so this is one example. Number of cars in a household. 
this is also counting something, so it's uh, 0, 1, 2, or 3, and so on. Okay, so this is a numerical discrete. The other numerical was uh, continuous. So continuous intuitively should mean that it's on the number line and in a sense more or less all values here should be possible. So when we deal with something that could be uh, in principle any value in an interval then we call it a continuous variable. So, for instance, examples could be temperature, price, in principle, yes, time, time to travel from A to B, weight of something. Many of these, for instance, physical things. Um, so, yeah, we will have quite different ways of presenting our data, whether it's um, considered discrete or continuous, actually. And we will sometimes be in doubt whether we should think of something as a discrete or continuous variables because the, there's no 100% exact way of defining the proper distinction mathematically. Um, because in well, if you think, think of the price for instance of a house say a Norwegian house, say in Norwegian Chrome, that doesn't matter but by the way. Um, it will typically, for instance, be at least a whole, an integer number of kroner. So if you want to argue really hard, you could say that it's going to be music. <laughs> So say something like, um, I think in my book or in the compendium I say something like this. So it's actually going to be an integer number of kroner. So and somewhere between zero, one, up to say 100 million. Um, so if you're really wanting to discuss and argue, you could say, okay, this is a prescribed set of values, although it's many, it's a prescribed set, so it's not continuous because it cannot have any value on an interval. But uh, what matter is really the, how we would like to treat this in a, uh, when we think of this. So uh, maybe one way to, um, to make the proper distinction is whether it makes sense from a practical point of view to talk about the probability say x is the variable would it make sense to talk about the probability that x is equal to a well for instance in x is the number of children of a woman, I would say yes, it makes sense. 
obviously. To, to talk about the probability that some Norwegian woman has two children, for instance. But if x is the price of a house, and you're asking what is the probability that this price is going to be exactly uh, 2,472,173 kroner, uh, does not really make sense. You don't ever want to take all this individual amount of kroner and try to assign a probability of each of those values. So the alternative is to ask, does it make sense to rather ask whether your variable is in some interval on the line? So if this doesn't make sense, but this does make sense, you are most likely talking about the continuous. Okay. So the distinction is not 100% clear, but you see that something happens when there is a very large number of numeric values. You tend to with want to consider something as continuous, even though it's on integers, for instance. So, yeah. Yeah, so this is the two types of numerical variables that we are considering. And then there is what we call categorical variables. Now we are, for the most part, out of numerical settings, although we shall see that sometimes we assign numbers also to categorical data. So there are two uh, main types of categorical variables also. One of them is called a nominal. And those of you who know a little bit of Latin, you know that nomen means name. So it's called nominal because they are sort of defined only by, uh, only by name in a way. Or, yeah. So it's things like um, yeah, if you run a production facility of Toyota Prius and you want to register all of the cars by and you register their color. Um, which could be, well, there is a limited number of colors but that they use normally, and, but they would register this like green, blue, black, and so on. And there is, Typically, no point in assigning or coding this as numbers, saying that one means green, two means blue, and so on. Let's see. Okay. 
So you could use this as a, for instance, if these are market data, that these are the cars you have sold, and you could make sort of a one to be a little bit ahead of myself. You could represent the distribution in the market or the preferences for green. Here you have 8% sold last year. So you know something about the expected um, preference for green cars in this segment. So that might help you a little bit in your production planning, for instance. So what I'm saying here is that a, a pie chart like this is a typical way of visualizing a categorical variable. And I'm coming back to that. Um, so the other type of categorical variable is what we call ordinal. And to remember the distinction, you remember that this has to do by name. And ord has to deal with some sort of order, right? So even though some things are not uh, explicitly numerical, there may be possible to sort of order them in a in a natural way. So, for instance, there is an example up there. Um, in a region, in a country, you could talk about the degree of industrialization from low, medium to high, and there is a natural order of that. Whereas, whereas there is no natural order between these colors. Another very typical example is uh, kind of answers in a survey. They are very often like, uh, you ask them, are you in favor or what is your view on this question here? And then they say they have choices between agree or very often totally agree, agree, and then there's a kind of neutral and disagree. Mm? If someone answered, not concerned. Not concerned? Well, you could have an alternative saying that I don't care or couldn't care less. Or then it's not ordinary anymore. But it, it must be in the list. Well, what happens then is your data will miss a value for this person in that spot, I guess. Yeah. And this happens all the time, in fact. Um, um, so there could be a question, uh, yeah. It's very frequent that, that uh, a question doesn't apply to you for some reason, so then you just don't an answer it. Um, in this case, there is also a natural ordering in terms of agreement to the proposition or whatever. So what they usually do in, in analysis, you assign numbers to this. Yeah. So that would be an ordinal variable also. Okay. So this is so far just talking about different types of variables. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about um, key numbers. So how do we summarize data in the most basic ways by key numbers? Just gonna try to figure out what 
I want to say about this. Yeah. So the mean um, This will most of, often apply to, of course, numerical numerical variables, and maybe a bit more often to continuous than to uh, to discrete data, but. So the mean, if you have a variable, let's say, um, if you have a data set or a variable x, then your observations in the data set will be labeled typically x1, x2, x3, down to xn. This is a notation that we're going to use all through the course, so you might uh, just uh, get used to that. Um, so these are what we call N observations of X. And if you have another variable Y here, it will look like uh, Y1, Y2 y3 down to yn. Yeah. So the mean of the x observations here is what we call x bar. Um, I'm trying to remember, because many of you may have had statistics, but yes. maybe in not in English actually. So if you don't know the English name for this, it's written x bar, where this is x and this is the bar, by the way. So it's x bar and the corresponding here will be y bar. And by definition, it's 1 over n times the sum of all the observations. So it's the arithmetic average, in a way. Um, So we might just uh, look at our data here. Um, yeah, so here we have a set of, I think, about 110 countries. And if I say X is the population, then X1, X2, and so on are these numbers down here. And this is in, in um, thousands, I guess. Yeah. So this is eight, eight million, what? Right? Eight thousand thousand. Yeah. So what is X bar? Well, let's ask SPSS. Okay, I'm not expecting you to be learning anything in SPSS now. We're going to do that in chapter two, but just to get a feeling of it, I'm going to sometimes use it anyway. Um, so we have some menu called descriptive statistics here that does a lot of these things. So I want the population in thousand options. I want the mean. And let me add the standard deviation and the minimum and the maximum also. And just click OK. And you get this neat little summary here showing that the mean population in the sample is something like close to 48 million. You know this notation here? This means a uh, million. OK, 
Okay, so what does it mean? Uh, mean? Uh, um, ideally, so the mean is supposed to be a typical value. So mean is called a measure of central tendency and we think of it intuitively sometimes as a typical value for x and it's very widely used of course. But there are some dangers with a mean if you have um, what I call skewness in the distribution of data here. So let's see if we can pick up the uh, I don't know exactly how annoying it is that I change uh, <laughs> between this this place but Up to the left there is um, a display of the population of the whole sample of 109 countries. Um, and you see obviously this, this distribution is extremely skewed as we say. There are a few very large countries and a small number of fairly large countries and then there are more and more smaller and smaller countries. So if you take the average of these countries, the average of these populations, you end up somewhere, yeah, somewhere here, I guess. And I counted actually by some method and found that for population data, only 23 of 109 countries uh, okay. so you have a sample, you compute the mean and you say that this is a typical population, 47.7 million but there are only 23 of the 109 countries, so less than 25% of the countries are actually above this value. So most of them are way below this. And what happens is, of course, that these two, especially these two giant countries, they put extremely weight on this sum, so it pulls the average uh, way above where the typical country lies. So the alternative measure is the median. So what is the median? It is um, basically instead of computing the sum and dividing by the number, we just order the observations on the line. So here is zero and then populations and like this. So we just count, say there are 109, then we count one, two, three, four, up to half of this, which is approximately 54. So I guess the Observation somewhere number 54 in here will be the median. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Just think it intuitively about it. You, you number the observations and then you take the middle one if there is a middle one, or if there are two middle ones, you take the average of those two. 
So if n is odd medium is the middle and is even. There isn't really a single middle observation, so you take the average of two middle most. So it's fairly intuitive without going into any mathematical detail. And the main distinction between the median and the mean is that the, the median will not be very affected whether I have two, for instance, very large observations. So if I took India and China and put them down here, for instance, to a more ordinary size, it would not move the median at all. But it would do a lot to the, to the mean. Yeah. So the, the short moral of this is that if you have a very skewed distribution with some outliers, you might want to consider the median rather than the mean as a measure of the typical uh, value. So, some very common examples where the mean in a population or a mean in a sample can be very misleading is figures like income or fortune or wealth. I mean, the monetary wealth of some. So, for instance, people in Molde, they commonly earn something like 300,000 to 600,000 before tax, almost zero after tax, or at least almost half of this after tax. While there are a few people from Molde who earns in a good year 150 million, for instance. So if you put these guys on, or these people on our line, you have zero, you have all the ordinary people, and then you have the guy who owns the oil share, something like that, or the pop star, or whatever. And if you take the mean, I mean, this guy could be earning more than all of them together, and if you take the mean, you could end up here, showing that any normal person earns a lot more than the mean. So all people are poor in that picture. Um, but if you take the median, it will sit at this point, regardless of whether that particular person is in the sample or not. So, yeah. Is there a relationship between the mean and the median when we analyze? Um, a mathematical relationship. Not that I know of, in any simple way, at least. Uh, For example, if the mean and the median is close together, does that mean? Well, <laughs> well, that expresses some, some sort of symmetry in the distribution, right? So if you had, no, if not a possibility. If this was fortune, then, OK, ordinary fortunes. And if you had another guy who had depth, down here, <laughs> you take the mean, you might end up in the middle here. Um, or, yeah. So basically, it's, if it's symmetrical, then the mean and the median will be quite similar. Yeah. Is oh. it mandatory to take both the mean and median? Are it, uh, it depends on the data what we are uh, yeah, as nothing is mandatory here. It's just a matter of, uh, and this is very difficult to formalize. But this is what you're going to do when you write reports and stuff. Are we going to report the median or the mean? Maybe both. I can tell you that now. You have to sort of learn the flavor of the subject and then find the most appropriate decision ultimately. Although I know students hate to hear this because they won't. Rules use uh, 
the median if so and so and use the mean if so and so. I don't know any particular such rules. It's more like common sense. In this case, it would be it would be very little fruitful to talk about the mean. Say this is nine hundred thousand or one point five million. This number has nothing to tell us about the income distribution here, except that there is one very rich guy and a lot of normal people. So in this situation, the, the choice is obvious. If you want to talk about m typical income, you talk about the, the median here. Or you simply discard this guy from the sample and say that that's something else. He's not an ordinary person. I think we just gonna take a break here for 15 minutes.